and welcome. Good to see you all this morning. Uh, Elevate kids, you may be dismissed. And uh, by way of introduction, I want to, uh, to welcome you all. And uh, if you're a guest with us, there's a bulletin. There's a little flap on that. You can tear it off and uh, drop that into the offering plate uh, when that goes by in just a few minutes. And listen, tonight at 5 o'clock, and I want to invite all of you who have not taken this class or if it's been a long time since you have taken this class, uh, we're doing our starting point uh, 101 class tonight at 5 o'clock. And, uh, and Jerry's coming, right? Jerry's going to be here tonight. If you don't know Jerry, uh, you need to get to know Jerry. He's a neat guy. And uh, so I hope that you'll be here tonight. And a matter of fact, if you haven't taken this class, I wanted to get your, your name and uh, your phone number and email. And uh, that way I can put you on our list so we'll be ready for you tonight. And so it's tonight at 5 o'clock, and we're going to meet right up here in this classroom up here. And so I hope that you come and uh, be part of that. If you haven't taken the class, it would be a great chance for you to take it. If it's been a long time since you've taken the class, uh, I would recommend that you take it again. Okay, so we'll start the clipboard over here. And uh, if you'd like to come, sign up, and that way we'll be ready for you. We'll have the coffee on, and uh, we'll have a great time of, uh, of fellowship this evening. And uh, I want us to, to be connected with each other. I want us to get to know uh, each other. And uh, I think I know everybody here, but you probably don't know everybody here. And so this is what I want you to do, okay? I want you to get to know somebody you don't know this morning, okay? Uh, and I know it's cold, and I know you're tired, right? And so I want you, to, in just a minute, to find somebody that you don't know, okay? Uh, does everybody know uh, Barbara over here? Barbara's my neighbor, right? If you don't know Barbara, uh, in just a second, I want you to come see her. She lives behind me. And, uh, and so that would be a great chance for you to see Barbara. And uh, is it hot in here or is it just me? It's cold, right? It's cold. It's hot. You know, I tell you what, man, you guys, uh, no satisfying this group, right? And, uh, and so anybody uh, uh, who doesn't know everybody, okay, uh, I want to give you a chance to, to meet everybody. So this is what I want you to do, okay? I'm going to give you about a minute to do it. Uh, I want you to find somebody that you don't know this morning, and this is what I want you to do, okay? Introduce yourself to them. And, uh, and tell them what size shoe you wear, okay? Because uh, I want to see who has the biggest foot here uh, this morning. And uh, Pastor Bruce wears a size 14, so you've got to beat that. Uh, all right, so stand to your feet, okay? And uh, find somebody that you don't know, introduce yourself to them, and then return back to your seat after you told them what size shoe you wear, okay? All right, if you can find your way back to your seats. And uh, I trust that you had a chance to meet somebody new this morning. And uh, it's really neat to have uh, new people come, and uh, it's great to, uh, to meet them and be reacquainted with them. And uh, there's, there's power in connection, and as we connect with one another, uh, we are energized by each other. And so uh, thank you for taking a minute to meet somebody that you, uh, that you don't know. You know, every Sunday I like to, uh, to highlight some members who have gone above and beyond uh, the call of duty. And uh, so this week I want to have a, a, a lift up uh, for Bo and uh, Bo Josu, and, uh, and Greg Shields, and uh, John Pierce, and Ted Schindler, and, uh, and Ben Godfrey, and these guys uh, got together on Monday, and that sounds like ancient history, right? Last Monday, Martin Luther King uh, Day, the last day that we had that was above freezing, right? <laughs> uh, it was 70 degrees last Monday, and so we worked and uh, moved the air conditioning and heating system, uh, put some of the siding up on the building, and uh, got a lot of work done uh, that day. So I want to thank these guys for working so hard. And uh, next Sunday, I'm going to update you guys with uh, the pictures of the progress that we have made uh, with our building, and it's coming along. It's really exciting uh, to see that happening. And uh, over the next two or three weeks, they'll be cutting a new parking lot uh, in the back for us. And so uh, that's exciting to see that. The building is starting to get closed in. And as soon as the weather warms up, uh, the bricklayers will be uh, laying brick. And so things are starting to come together. It's really neat to see it. And uh, you can't get out there through the, the back doors, but you can go around and look to see what's happening if you want to take a look at it. But I did want to thank uh, those men uh, and Ansley for getting us lunch on Monday. Uh, you know, we work, work hard. We're going to eat hard. And uh, so thank you very much, guys, for your help. And uh, good things are happening. God is doing incredible things as we see how he's moving uh, through our, our outreach efforts and through our uh, construction process. And so I'm so happy to give you that report and let you know what all is happening, okay? Well, we're going through a series called Living Large. And I sent you an email, so hopefully you had a chance to read Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 11 through 27. And if you uh, have your Bible, please turn there. 
And uh, if you don't, uh, we'll try to have most of the things on the overhead for you. Uh, But uh, every week I want to encourage you to bring a Bible, and uh, that way you can follow along, bring a pen, uh, so that you can take notes. And the reason we take notes is because 95% of what I say this morning you will forget by Wednesday morning, and uh, so that's really encouraging uh, for me. You know, I spend 15, 18 hours or 20 hours a week uh, putting together a message that you're going to forget uh, within three days. So what we do is we give you notes. Uh, so that you can review them, and uh, you can study them, and hopefully it will make an impact on you, okay? Well, we're talking about living large. Last week, we talked about the subject of, uh, you know, taking advantage of the opportunities that God gives us, seizing the moment. And uh, this morning, we want to continue on with that, and we're talking about big faith, living large in our faith, and if we do that, it's going to involve a big risk, okay? And, And we, by nature, most of us are not risk takers, but look what Jesus said in Luke 19, 26, and uh, this is the message translation. Jesus said, risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe, and, and I love how Eugene Patterson puts this together. He says, play it safe, and you're stuck holding the bag, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but at the end of my life, I don't want to get back uh, to my years when I'm 80 years old or 90 years old and say, you know, I wish I had done some more things uh, for God. I wish I had taken some bigger risks. For him, as a matter of fact, they did a survey with with people that were in their retirement age years, and they said, what is your biggest regret? The second biggest regret they had is that they didn't take more risks with their lives. They played it safe in everything they did. And and many of them said, well, I wanted to start a business. I wanted to do this venture. I wanted to go to this place. I wanted to accomplish this, but they didn't take the risk to get it done. So I want to challenge you, when God moves upon your heart to do something, Don't be afraid to take a risk and do it. As you look at what God wants to do, one guy said this, and I don't know who said it, if you never take risk in life, you'll never see anything new. Uh, So when you take a risk in life, as God is leading you, then you can see something new. And there's another saying that goes like this, no matter what a person's past may have been, his future is spotless. So so maybe you haven't, in the past, been much of a risk taker, but maybe God is moving in your heart to do something, and he's challenging you, and you say, well, I messed up in the past, that's why I'm afraid to take risks. The fear of failure is the number one reason why we don't take major risks in our lives. But you know, the future is spotless for you. The future is ahead of you. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen in the future, so why not try to take a risk for God as he leads you in the future? As we look at 2013, it's past, okay? And uh, the mistakes that you made last year, leave them last year. Because if you bring them into this new year, you are doomed to repeat those mistakes. Wise is the person who says, I'm going to learn from my mistakes. I'm not going to complete, uh, completely do them over again. I'm going to take them as learning experiences, and I'm going to move on. 2014 is right ahead of us. And we have the whole year to take some risks for God. Now, to help us with this, I wanted to talk to you a few things uh, about a story that Jesus gives. And you are familiar with this story, but I want to give you some background uh, with it. But before we do that, there's a passage in the book of Ecclesiastes that I wanted us to walk through. Ecclesiastes 11 says this, when the clouds are full of water, it rains. When the wind blows down a tree, it falls where it It lies where it falls. Don't sit there watching the wind. Do your own work. Don't stare at the clouds. Get on with your life. Just as you'll never understand the mystery of life forming in a pregnant woman, so you'll never understand the mystery at work and all that God does. Go to work in the morning and stick with it until the evening. I love this little phrase, without watching the clock. You'll never know from moment to moment how your work will turn out in the end. So so here Solomon is giving us this great challenge. And he's saying, take advantage of the moments that are before you. Don't be just observing what God is doing. Be part of what God is doing. Don't just watch just because you are not, uh, you're afraid to jump in there. Go ahead and jump in there. Don't worry about not understanding everything. We don't ever understand everything. Jump on ahead as God is leaving you. Unfortunately, most of us by nature are not risk takers. We like to play it safe. Hudson Taylor, that great missionary, 
and that great man of faith who founded the Christian Inland Mission integrated faith with risk when he said, unless there is an element of risk in our exploits for God, there is no need for us to have faith. When you look at exercising your faith, faith is not given to us for things that we know exactly how they're going to come out. That requires no faith. Faith is trusting God who you know on an intimate and close level. And as you take that next left, that step as he is leading you, there's always that element of risk. As our faith increases, the level of risk also increases. But we can do it as God is leading us. You say, I am afraid to go out and take a risk because I don't want to get out in a storm. I don't want to get out and, fa- and fail. You know, a calm sea does not produce a skilled sailor. A skilled sailor is one who has gone through storms, taken some risks, and came out okay on the other side. Henry Ford said, There is no man living who isn't capable of doing more than he thinks he can do. Every one of us are in that category. We can take advantage of what God has given us to do, and we can accomplish more than we actually are accomplishing right now. Jesus talks about this, and he challenges his disciples, and he challenges those who are around him. So to give you the text and the context of where we're going this morning, in Luke chapter 19, we have the story beginning with the first part of the chapter of a guy by the name of Zacchaeus, right? Maybe from Sunday school or from children's church years ago, you remember the story of Zacchaeus. Here is the songs to a lyrics, uh, the lyrics to the song that we used to sing when we were kids, right? And I was going to play it, and uh, I found a YouTube video that has it, uh, but maybe you remember this song, okay? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up into the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. Now, now this last little phrase I forgot, okay? I'm going to your home to stay, okay? So, so Christ is staying with you. It was a risk for Zacchaeus to come out of that tree. He was a short man. He was a despised man. And so he's climbed up in this tree. He wanted to see what was happening. Jesus passes by. Zacchaeus seizes the moment because Jesus says, Get out of that tree. I'm coming to your house today. And I'm coming to your house to stay. In other words, Zacchaeus, it's going to be a risk. I am coming to your house. You are despised but I'm going to go ahead and associate with you. It is a risk for you to be associated with me. And as I go into your house, salvation is going to be brought to your home, and I'm going to stay with you. There's going to be an element of, of risk as the Savior passes by. So you see, timing is everything. When God moves, as we talked about last week, that is the time for us to move. When he moves upon our heart to do something, don't delay in obeying. Follow immediately. As we look at the story this morning, we see there's a big choice that is given, and some people are seizing the moment, some are not. As we go through, I want to read Luke 19, beginning at verse number 11, and Jesus is just coming off of sharing with the disciples the conversion of Zacchaeus. You know, when somebody gets saved, that's always a good teaching moment. That's always a good opportunity to say, okay, this is what we're going to learn from this. And at the end of that verse, verse number 10, before we get into verse number 11, Jesus says, this is why I've come. I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. But he doesn't leave it right there. He says, that's not the end of my story. That is really the beginning of my story. I have come to bring you salvation, not so that you can only enjoy my presence, but because I have something for you to accomplish now that you have accepted this gift of salvation. Now, now there's going to be an element of risk when you follow through. Saving faith is a level of faith that you have to accept the free gift of salvation. But there's also sustaining faith and growing faith that will help you to become more like Christ. And this is where the element of risk will come into your life. So Jesus says, this is a great opportunity for me to teach this to you. You have just seen something radical happening. You've seen Zacchaeus come, a guy that we never dreamed would be born again, a guy that was hiding up in a tree, that was fearful, but he took a risk. Now, disciples and all of those who follow Christ, as you're listening to this, we pick it up, verse number 11. Jesus says, as they were listening to this, 
the conversion service of Zacchaeus, he goes on and he tells them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once, okay, uh, Jesus is already correcting bad teaching or bad theology. You see, they're thinking that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom on this earth. But verse number 10 says, I didn't come for that. He says, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. There will be a time when he comes to establish his kingdom, but the first time he came, that was not the purpose. So Jesus is telling them about a man of noble birth. He went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Verse number 13. So we call his servants and he gave them 10 minutes. Now, now if you don't know what a minute is, a minna is, not a minnow, a minna is about three months wages. So this guy is giving out to each person three months wages. And he gives them instruction. He says, here's what I'm giving you. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. However, some of his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, I know they said a delegation. Hey, guys, go tell the master we don't want to have a king over us. Tell him we don't want this man to be our king. Now, now, now get this. How, how can they really think this way? They've just received, right, three months' salary, right? The king has just given them three months' salary. Here's the point. As we get through the message today, when God gives us something as, as expensive and valuable as salvation, here is where so many Christians get stuck. They never grow past that saving faith. God blesses them. God turns their lives around. God says, I want you to go a little further with me. I want you to take a risk for me. I, I've given you everything that you need. At the moment of salvation, God not only gives you everlasting life, he gives you a gift, a spiritual gift, that he wants you to use to accomplish his purposes for your life. He gives us everything we need, but so many times this is what happens. We say, I don't want him, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want him to be king of my life. I just want him to be my savior. Isn't that good enough? I don't really want him to be my Lord. Jesus is trying to drive home this point. The most dangerous place of your life as you follow Christ is not immediately after you become a Christian, but it's a few years into your walk with Christ when you stop taking risks for Christ. When we stop taking risks and moving on ahead as God has commanded us to move ahead, we have no other alternative to do except to start criticizing. And this is why it's so important that we continue to grow as risk takers, as we continue to move out. Because when we start looking in, every one of us has this little bit of a rebel spirit within us that says, I don't want anybody over me. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. It's up to me. I am the boss of my destiny. And how dare somebody tell me what to do? As we look at what happens here, the king was made king anyway. He returns home, and then he sent for a servant to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. Verse 16, okay, here's the first guy. We only find out about a few of the guys. We don't find out about all ten of them, okay? The first guy came and said, Sir, your minna has earned, your one minna has earned ten more. Your, your three months' wages has earned thirty months' wages. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second guy comes in, and he said, Sir, your minna has earned five more. His master answered, Well, you're going to take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your minna. I have kept it, and I have laid it away in a piece of cloth, because I was afraid, because you are a hard man. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why are we lying? You are a hard man. A hard man doesn't give you three months of a talent and say go invest it but if you think that jesus and god is a hard person he is a hard person as we look at how this thing unfolds 
it says that you take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. This is a lie. His master replies, okay, you think I'm a hard man. I will judge you by your own words. You wicked servants, you knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you take that money, deposit it, so that when I came back, I could have collected it with at least interest? He said, so the least you could have done is put this in the bank and get a little interest on it coming back. But you didn't even do that. Then he said to those standing by, take this minna away from him, And give it to the one who has ten minutes. Some of us as we're leading this say, wait a minute, that is not fair. Can I put you into a little secret here? God is not fair. He is just, but he is not fair. Salvation is not fair. It's not fair that Jesus should die so that I could have everlasting life. That is not fair. Jesus did absolutely nothing, yet he died for me. That is not fair. But the justice of God was satisfied by the atonement of Jesus Christ on that cross 2,000 years ago. And although it's not fair, he offers it to everybody. He gives everybody that opportunity. Not only does he give everybody that opportunity to receive the gift of salvation, He takes you to that next level and says, I also want you to grow in your faith. I have given you some abilities. I've given you some talents. I want you to take those and I want you to multiply those. I don't want you to squander those gifts that I have given you. Verse 23, sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, Even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Wow. We learn from this parable that Jesus has given us that the bigger risk we take for God, the greater the reward we receive. The lesser risk that we take, the lesser reward. If we take no risk for God, we even lose what he has given us. Now, on a natural realm, we understand this, okay? If you have a talent and you don't use it, you lose it, right? If you can sing, but you stop singing and you never practice anymore, you begin to lose that talent. If it works on the natural level, how much more does it work on the spiritual level? So there are four things that I want to share with you this morning when it comes to this matter of taking a risk that we extrapolate from this particular parable that Jesus is sharing with us. And here's the first one that's found in verse number 13, and it is this, where God guides, he always provides, okay? As God is guiding us to take a risk, somehow, some way, he always provides. And so we look at this opportunity that these 10 servants were given. They were each given something, they were given money to put it to work. And he says, put it to work until I come back. Uh, This is everything that you need to follow through. I'm guiding you by giving you all of this provision that you need. And I'm going to accomplish, you can accomplish it. You can do it. It, it, There is an element of risk because you don't know how your investment is going to come forth. But you're going to do it, okay? Isn't it amazing that so many people are willing to take a risk on money that we have been given. But we're not willing to take a risk on following God. We will probably lose, and many of us have lost, right? I mean, how many of you are 413 uh, or 401? It's not worth near as much as it was five years ago. Yeah, 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 we take a risk on that, right? And uh, yeah, we lost something on it. We lost a lot on it, but we're still taking a risk on it. God asks us to do the same. The difference is when we take a risk with him, he always provides for us. He gives us everything that we need. Everything that we need. You see, the problem is that they were looking for a quick return on their investment. They were looking for the kingdom to be established immediately. Salvation came to Zacchaeus, the wee little man, the son of Abraham. And he came, Jesus came, to seek and to save those 
who were lost. If you flip over to Luke chapter 24, in verses 50 to 52, Jesus gets more specific about how he is going to establish his kingdom in the future. In verse 50 of Luke chapter 24, it says, When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. This is called the ascension. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continuing at, continuing at the temple, praising God. Here we see that Jesus, as he ascends up into heaven, they are changed because of this ascension. They are continuing to worship in the temple, praising God. God was going to constantly provide for them as long as they were continuous in their praising to God, and they were consistent in coming and worshiping God. Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, My God shall supply everything that you need in accordance to his riches in Christ Jesus. Everything that we need to take the risk that God has led us to take is given to us. As God guides, he provides. The psalmist put it this way in Psalm 91. If you hold on to me for dear life, I'll get you out of any trouble. It doesn't say you won't have trouble, but he says, I'll get you out of trouble. I'll give you the best of care, and it will get you to know me and trust me for the rest of your life. He says, you look at your life, you can't get too much done when you always know what's going to happen around the future. You can't get too much done when you only work the days that you feel like working or you only worship the days that you feel like worshiping. My God will provide all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Here's the second thing about taking a risk. Not only do we know that where God guides, he provides, but when we're taking a risk, there's always a delay in how God moves. When God delays, it is always for our best and for his glory. As we drop down to verse number 14, the subjects hated him, and sent a delegation after him. He says, we don't want this man to be our king. And he was made king, however, and he returned home. We don't know how long he was gone, but he was gone for an extended period of time, and he returns home. He is delaying his coming back so that he can work out his best in us and so that he can become glorified. Then he sent the servants to him who had given him the money in order to find out what they had gained. You see, we are living in a day and age of instant gratification, instant satisfaction, right? We have fast food lanes. Everything is fast. We hate delay. I heard about a furniture company, and on the front lawn of their business, this antique shop was advertising antiques while you wait. Antiques while you wait. That's going to be a long wait if you're waiting for an antique. All right, Max Lucado says that America... It's a country of shortcuts and fast lanes. We're the only nation on the earth with a mountain that's called Rushmore, right? And so we're constantly moving on ahead. Jesus warned of this, and he says in Matthew 6, 31, don't run after things like the pagans do. Don't run after things in this world like the pagans do. In Habakkuk chapter 2, it says, these plans, this is a prophecy that God has given to Habakkuk. These plans won't happen right away, slowly, steadily, surely. The time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. It seems slow, but don't despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They are not overdue one single day. You know, as God delays things in our lives, there's always a purpose for it, and it is always in the long run for our best and for his glory. If we had things instantly satisfied in our lives, we would have this tendency to glorify ourselves. Look at how I brought this thing together, and look how fast I brought it together. In John chapter 13, verse number 7, it says, Do you not realize Jesus is speaking? Do you not realize now that I'm doing what I'm doing? You don't know now what I'm doing, but... Later you will understand. 
as we look at that whole scenario of Jesus in John chapter 13. He's looking out and he's got the disciples gathered around him and he's delaying some things. And, and he's doing it for a purpose. He's delaying things at the Passover meal. He's intentionally slowing things down. God does that to us when we take a risk. He delays things for us. In the case of Jesus delaying things, he was delaying things for a strange reason. He was slowing things down in the Passover meal because he knew somebody was getting ready to betray him. We would think, well, he's going to accelerate this time, but he slows it down for the right timing in the right moment. That's how God works in our lives. Sometimes he slows us down so that he can lighten up our ship because we're getting ready to go through the storm. And we're like, why is this being slowed down? We have done everything that we're supposed to do. Why are we not moving full speed ahead? Why is there this delay? There is a delay because God is working things out for the long-term best of us and for the long-term glory of himself. I think back about the days when we bought the property that we are now enjoying. Most of you were not here. We had put an offer on a very small piece of property that was really too small, and, uh, and, and God closed that door. And then this property became available. And we put an offer on this, and our offer got rejected. And we're going after delay, after delay, after delay. God was slowing us down, didn't allow us to get a smaller piece of the property. He says, because i got something much better for you, but you've got to wait. If you want to get ahead of me, you'll have less than what I want you to have. But if you will wait upon me, you will see things begin to unfold in my timing, in my way. You don't understand it right now but you will when you get on the other side. I remember we put a bid on this property and it got rejected. It's like, man, what's up with this? I said, man, I think God wants us to have this property. Why is he delaying this? Why did he allow somebody else to have a higher bid than we had? Well, well, there's two reasons now that I am looking at it from the backside, right? Hindsight is always 2020, but when you're right in the middle of the storm, you're not understanding what God is doing, but you just got to trust him and you just got to keep moving on. I knew now why God slowed us down. There was two reasons that God slowed us down. Reason number one is the price was going to be lowered. Reason number two, God was going to send some people to help pay for it. That's how he was working. We put an offer on the land that got rejected. Another guy put an offer on the land. His offer got accepted, but he couldn't get his money together. So they came back and says, hey, would you come back with a counteroffer? So we did. They wanted $365,000 for this property, and we offered $205,000, and lo and behold, they accepted our offer. Great. We're moving ahead. We've had a six-month delay on this, uh, but we're moving ahead. And then God says, I'm going to send somebody to help you with the down payment. I didn't know that at the time. I remember getting ready to go to closing on the property. The Sunday before the Friday we were closing on this property, I had a cheesy little thermometer up on the stage. It was real cheesy, okay? Almost as cheesy as the thermometer we have back there with all the puzzle pieces on it, right? Real real cheesy. And and we were $10,000 short on what we needed for the down payment. And I remember having services that day and going through, and and I said, man, well, we're going to go to closing. And uh, and I didn't say anything about the shortfall. And, you know, I had one of those gold master cards, and I said, well, I was slapping on that. And if the church can ever pay me back, great. If not, then that's great, too. That Sunday, the Friday before we closed, a man came to our services, recommitted his life to Christ. At the end of that service, he strikes a che- strokes a check for $10,000 and says, here, put this towards your building fund. He had no idea what we were doing. It was his very first Sunday visiting our church, and yet he strokes a check to pay the down payment. You see, if we had accelerated that process... We would have missed that down payment being paid. We would have paid way too much for something, or we would have had a piece of property way too small for what God is doing. God delays for a purpose. It is always for our best. When we're in the middle of that delay, we never see it. We never understand it. But hang in there. Keep following the vision that God has for your life. Don't get dismayed. Don't get discouraged. Don't go to the left or to the right. Keep moving on straight ahead. Now we're in the middle of our expansion. And God delayed us on this one, too. And there's a reason that he delayed it. You know, we got started, then we got stopped, and 
But here we are back on track. I'm not sure exactly at this stage of the game why God delayed us. I know that we're back on track. But I believe he delayed us so that some of you could be more involved in what God is doing. Some of you were not here when we even started the building program. This campaign actually got started four years ago. As God does things, we trust him, we take risks as he leads us. You know, adversity is going to come. You cannot get away from that. Adversity does one of two things to us. Always one of two things to us. Number one, when adversity comes, it will make you weaker. It will wear you down. It will knock you off track. Or number two, adversity will make you stronger. There's no middle of the ground for that. You've got to ask yourself, when delays are coming, when pressures are coming, am I going to keep moving on ahead and become stronger because I'm moving on ahead? Or am I going to get discouraged and drop off and become weaker? You know, when you stop doing what God calls you to do, you don't become stronger, you become weaker. When we're going through times of suffering and times of pain, there is always a reason for it. The Apostle Paul put it this way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, I want you to know, and I want to share with you, I don't want you to become uninformed when pressure comes your way, when you feel like it is far beyond your ability to endure endure it. Paul says, my life in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 was, was so filled with pressure, physical pressure, beatings, being shipwrecked, he says, it was beyond our ability to, abet, to, to handle it. He says, we even despaired of life. We even were concerned that we weren't going to make it to the next day. He says, in our hearts, he says, I felt the sentence of death. And in another passage, he says, we had the smell of death on us. But he said, verse number 9 of 2 Corinthians 1, this happened so that we might learn to trust Not in ourselves, but in God. Sometimes God will put pressure on us that is far beyond our ability to handle it. And he says, don't worry. If you trust me, you'll be okay. You may feel like you're going to die. You may feel like the future has no hope for you. But hang in there. Trust me. I will get you through this. Charles Stanley in his book, Success God's Way, writes, Don't wait until you can take a huge step. Take the step that you're able to take right now, and you'll be one step closer to success. When the pressure is on, we might have to take smaller steps because of the pressure that is on us, but we must continue to make progress. We must continue to move on ahead. Well, here's the third thing that we learned from this parable that Jesus shared with his disciples. Not only do we learn that when God guides, he provides We learned that when God delays things, it's always for our best and for his glory. But number three, what God is given, what we give to God, he always multiplies it. Always. Look at verse number 16. The first man came and said, sir, you gave me a minna. I'm investing it back. I'm giving it back. And it's going to grow. It's going to not just be added to. It's going to multiply. Good, my servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Wow, greater responsibility because you were taking a risk and you were giving back in the process of taking that risk. His master answered, you take charge of five cities to the next guy who brought a fivefold return on his minutes. You see, God gives us these gifts, these talents. They're like little seeds. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, he who gives you the seed will also multiply it. In your lives, he will increase the things that you do not have, uh, things that, that you have that have his approval. As you give things over to God, those seeds that he has given to you, It's a risk. I know it's a risk. But as you do that, he multiplies it. Many of you know John Pierce. John Pierce is a farmer, and and God gives the seed to the farmer, right? The farmer takes that seed, and he plants it. Two months ago, John planted seeds 
for strawberry plants, that he will not see the fruit until May or June. All the while, that seed is beginning to do things beneath the surface. Nobody sees what's happening. Nobody really completely understands what's happening, but something's happening below the surface of the ground. It is producing something. It is producing a fruit. There is a delay to that. It doesn't happen right away. He doesn't plant them on Monday and have strawberries on Tuesday. It takes several months for those plants to grow, to develop, and produce fruit. When he finally sees those strawberries come, he will have more seeds returned than he planted. That's how God works. He always multiplies what we invest for him. He always takes it and he increases it. Make it your goal in life to do everything to please God. Listen, you can't please many people, but you can please one God. Make it your goal not to be worrying about pleasing everybody because that's never going to happen. Make it your goal to please God. And as you're going through your life, you discover, yes, those who are also trying to please God, you will please them. But you cannot please all the people all the time, so why waste your time worrying about that? If God is happy with what you're doing and is living according to his word and as you're taking risks as he leads you, he will multiply that. Abraham Lincoln, in 1863, made a speech. And he said this. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and in prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and and strengthened us. We have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom or virtue of our own. Intoxicated with our unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to God who has made us. Paul put it this way in, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Remember, the person who plants a few seeds will have a small crop. The one who plants many seeds will have a large crop, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. Luke chapter 18, Jesus says, You won't regret it. No one who sacrifices his home, his spouse, his brothers, his sisters, his parents, his children, whatever, will lose out. It will all come back multiplied many times over in your lifetime. And the bonus is you get everlasting life. So always give yourself fully, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, to the work of the Lord because you know your labor is not in vain. God doesn't ever ask us to be the best. He only asks us to give our best. Dwight Eisenhower told the story of his days as a as a farmer in Kansas. And an old farmer had a cow for sale. The buyer asked about the cow's pedigree, butter fat production, and monthly milk production. The farmer said, I don't know what pedigree she is. I'm not even sure what pedigree is. But I don't, and I don't know how much butter fat she can produce, but she's a good cow, and she'll give you all the milk that she has. And that's all of us can do. Give all that we have. When God gives us a blessing, he says, take this blessing, take this talent, take this resource, invest it, take a risk with it, as I lead you to take that risk, and you discover that it multiplies. Here's the last thing that we learn from this parable that Jesus gave. What God starts, he always finishes. One day, those who hated the king We're going to be turning their hatred to the king to fear because God always finishes what he starts. If we were learned to fear a healthy respect of what God is doing in our lives, then we will have that love for him. He was made king, however, to finish giving out the reward, to finish giving out the punishment, he was made king. I believe Jesus here is referring to his second coming. Uh, The first time he came, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. We were in that period of waiting, 
that period of delaying where Christ has not come back yet, but I believe he's coming soon. When he comes again, those who hate him will have this fear for him. One day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is delaying his coming for our best and for his glory. That last person is going to pray one day to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and Christ is going to come back. Those who have hated him will have every knee bowed and every tongue confessed. Philippians 1.6 says that he who began a good work in you, that's Christ, will carry it out into the day of Christ, or will carry it out until the work is done. A Chinese proverb says this, the temptation to quit will always be greatest just before you succeed. What breaks my heart as a pastor is I've seen so many people give up on Monday when God was wanting to bless them on Tuesday. If they could have hung in there just a little bit longer, it always gets darkest just before the dawn. It always gets most difficult just before production takes place, just before the reward takes place. Colossians 1.6 says, The same good news that came to you. It's going all over the world. It's changing lives everywhere just as it changed yours. Man, I think about the future and what God is doing and how he has given us opportunity after opportunity to reach our community with the gospel of Christ. We must grow deeper in our relationship with him, not so that we can brag how deep our relationship with him is, it's so that we can weather the storm as we're going out, taking a risk, sharing the gospel with our neighbors, sharing the gospel with our friends. I promise you, There's a handful of people in your circle of influence who do not know Christ. They are waiting for you to take a risk. They're like Zacchaeus up in that tree, wondering what's going on, waiting for somebody to come along. That somebody is you. God has strategically placed you in the neighborhood in which you live, in the place in which you work, not so that you can just expand your talents, that's part of it, but so that you can be his mouthpiece, so that you can speak for him. There's a poem called Opportunities Missed. I put it on the overhead, and this is the last slide for this morning. I wanted to read this to you, because I don't want you to get to the end of your life and experience this. There was a very cautious man who never laughed or played. He never risked, he never tried, he never sang or prayed. And when he one day passed away, his insurance, his insurance was denied For since he never really lived, they claimed he never died. (laughs) You see, the tragedy isn't that you're going to die one day. We're all going to die one day. The tragedy is that you go through your whole life without really living, without really fulfilling what God wanted you to fulfill with your life. Life is short. Life is tough, right? But life is only 70, maybe 80, maybe 90 years, and then it's over. Serve the Lord. Take risks. For him. You know, one day we're all going to be gathered up in heaven and the books are going to be open. There's two books that are going to be opened. One is the Lamb's Book of Life. If you're in heaven, your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you're not, when that book is opened, you're cast into outer darkness. But there's also another book that's going to be open. It's going to be open at the beam of judgment, and that's when God is going to take out and look over our lives. We won't be judged for our sins because those have been taken care of at Calvary. Jesus has forgiven all of our sins, past, present, and future. But he will be giving us these talents, and and he has given us these talents, and that's where the beam of judgment comes in. As he's looking over our lives, he says, okay, what did you do with the talents that I have given you? Can, Can I say of you, well done, my good and faithful servant? Well done? When God says well done, there's a, it's implied that there's a something that's been accomplished. He, he doesn't say well intended. Intentions get you nowhere. God is interested in what we accomplish, not what we intended to do, not what we thought about doing, not what we figured out theologically that we should do, but actually what we do. It is required of a steward that he be found faithful, that he takes what God has given him and doesn't just let it sit somewhere, but he uses it. And it multiplies. God so wants to use every one of us to impact our community. Tonight in the class, I'll talk to you about the vision 
of our church, what we believe. I tell people there's two things you got to look at when you decide to join a church. Number one is their doctrine, their theology. What do they believe? Number two, how do they carry out what they claim to believe? What is their philosophy of ministry? How do they reach out into a community? Both of those questions are essential. As you look at your life, I believe that God is going to do great things as we begin this new year and as we trust him for big things. So I want to pray that we will take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. Be a risk taker. Be a risk taker for God. Maybe you're afraid to talk to that neighbor about Christ. Man, be a risk taker. Go talk to him. Maybe you're afraid to give the way that you know you should give. Be a risk taker. Be one who says, hey, you know what? God owns everything. He owns all the money that I think I am managing. It's all his. I'm going to trust him with it. I'm going to be a risk taker. I'm going to invest in something that's much bigger than I am. One of the reasons I'm so much involved with the church is because the church is the one institution that will outlive me. A hundred years from now, my grandchildren may be in this church. I will not be. I'll be dead and gone. But a hundred years from now, the investment that you make today will continue to be uh, benefiting those who come along. That's why the church is such a great place to be hooked into because we're making an internal difference in the lives of so many people. So let's pray that we will be risk takers this year. As you pray, ask the Lord to reveal to you an area of your life that you've got to take a risk on, that you've got to move out on, and you've got to move ahead on. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet for just a moment. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to pray us out. And then the ushers are going to come, receive the offering. I'll make a few announcements, and then we'll, we'll head on out to Sunday school. But as we look at this new year, I want you to know that when God begins the work in you, he always finishes it. Where God guides, he always provides. What we give back to God he always multiplies it. As you look in your life, there's so many opportunities for us to be investing what God has given us. Every one of us can do a little more than we're doing. And so that's my challenge to you this morning, to be a risk taker for God. Not reckless with your faith, but seeking God's face. And as he leads you, you take that risk. Father God, here we are gathered this morning on this January 26th, in the year of our Lord, 2014. Lord, this is a day that you have made. You have given us another day to serve you, another day to love you, another day to embrace our family, our church family, our biological family. You've still given us these, these gifts. You've given us these opportunities. Lord, this morning... Help us not to, to, to grasp onto those and, and squander them and, and hide them under a, a handkerchief somewhere. But Lord, would you give us the ability to take a risk for you, to step out on faith. And Lord, as we do that, we know that you will multiply what we do. So we're asking for wisdom. We're asking for strength to be all that you want us to be. Lord, your kingdom is going to come one day and be established here temporarily on this earth for a thousand-year reign millennial reign and they will have eternity in heaven to spend with you and how we will be ruling in heaven will be predicated upon how we rule here on the earth how we take the talents that you have given us Lord maybe somebody in this room says I'm only a one talent person and I can't do a whole lot but they can do something Lord, there's may, maybe others here who have five talents and, and you've blessed them enormously and, and they can produce a whole lot more and and maybe there's one or two that are ten talent Christians and, and you've given them ten minutes and, and, and they've multiplied it and so Lord, help them multiply it again. Lord, we praise you for just the opportunity to be all that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Ushers, would you come at this time to receive uh, the offering? And uh, as they're doing that, I've got a couple of things I need to let you know about. Uh, the marriage conference is the first, okay? Uh, please sign up for the marriage conference. Uh, there is a reduced rate uh, that you've got to take advantage of by, uh, is it tomorrow night at midnight? Tomorrow night at midnight, the price goes up, okay? Uh, so there is an insert, I believe, in the bulletin. 
uh, and that t- tells you all about it, this red insert. So please take advantage of this marriage conference. And uh, so go ahead and sign up. Right now you're getting it at half price if you sign up before tomorrow night at midnight. So please uh, take advantage of that. And then we are doing a fundraiser for our youth, and uh, they are selling donuts. Uh, so uh, please see one of our youth if you are interested in buying uh, Krispy Kreme donuts, and they will deliver them to your home, or you can pick them up here uh, at church. And I believe all the information for that is in the, in the bulletin, so check that out. And uh, that's a great opportunity for you to be involved in helping our kids uh, go to, uh, to camp. And then youth camp, uh, recharge youth camp, January 15th through the 20th. And uh, that is for those who have completed 7th through 12th grade. All that information is in the bulletin, but your initial deposit is due on or before February the 10th, so please uh, make sure that you take care of that. And then if your child is younger, uh, Center Kid is July 14th through the 18th. Uh, Same thing, their $50 deposit is due by the 10th of February. So please get your spot uh, reserved by making that deposit, and uh, we'll have your kids, and uh, we'll look forward to a great week spending uh, with them, okay? All righty, thank you for all your hard work this week. Uh, Don't forget about the class tonight, starting point class tonight at 5 o'clock. I hope that you'll be here with us, okay? All right, we've already prayed, and uh, so thank you for being with us. God bless you. You are dismissed.